So, yeah. so there's a concept called Cenius that Brian Eno put into the vernacular and I was asked to study it by my friend Sebastian Paquette. Mm-hmm. So I looked into it. I really contemplated it and I said, oh, you know, Cenius is the genius of the scene is the, is the notion, but it's, it's, it has a characteristic of um, you know, pick, pick anything that's really meaningfully happened. Uh, and generally it's a scene, you know, whether it's impressionism or it's existentialism or it's punk rock or skateboarding or scientific method or whatever, right? There's always some collection of people in it, and it kind of unfolds in a very particular way, um, which is that there's a, a period of time where it's not named, a period of time where it's, it's happening, but nobody knows that it's happening. And nobody knows who else is doing it. You're just doing it. And the people who are early in are usually a little bit weird, a little bit, um, let's call them visionary or freaky or broken or tuned in, you know, filling your, Mm -hmm. pick your poison. Um, But they have this thing where they can nod to each other when they begin to see somebody else. You're like, oh, wait a minute, dude. You are tuned into kind of the same vibe I'm tuned into. Hmm. Hmm. That's interesting. I can see the beauty that you're producing in a way that other people can't see it because I can Mm -hmm. kind of, like you say, it's coming from the future, but I can also see the future, brother. Mm-hmm. Um, and by the way, always intermediated by the fact that you've got some pretty broken folks with their ability to actually cooperate as humans may actually get a hell of a lot in the way. Mm-hmm. But the senius then begins to emerge. It reveals itself. It starts to name itself. Different roles begin to show up. It becomes more and more embodied. Eventually, it gets coined. A coin in lands. It's not cyberspace. It's not the interwebs. It's not the digital superhighway. It's the internet, right? It just it settles, settles, settles. And then it moves through a different stage of its development. Usually, it closes it, it becomes sort of an, an enclosure and then it becomes extracted and then it evaporates usually, but not, not always. In the, in the incipients I proposed in that, in that consideration, there were three primary roles that are um, like, well, now that I know Forrest Landry, I would, I would put them in a triadic relationship, but essentially there was what I called the source. Um, and the source is kind of like the, you know, the velvet underground or the pixies, right? It's, it's the, it's the character where if you don't know the scene, you probably haven't even heard of them. Mm-hmm. But if you do know the scene, you're like, yeah, those are the fucking guys. Like, mm-hmm. It's that, it's that thing. The one who really, really is the closest to the transcendent energy of the thing that is being uh, expressed, but isn't necessarily the best at expressing it. And definitely isn't the most attractive in expressing mm-hmm. it. Uh, so then you've got the charismatic. The charismatic is the one who renders the scene into livingness, the one who makes it attractive to other people to want to participate, uh, learns how to convert it, the energy of the scene into currencies that are legible to people who aren't in the scene. You know, mm-hmm. The guy who gets laid because he's a rock star, right? right. You're like, holy shit, you can get laid by being a rock star? Hold on, what is that? I want, right. I want to get closer to that thing. Um, who, by the way, you know, the kind of the weird skinny guy with long hair and definitely can't throw a football who gets laid because he's a mm-hmm. rock star. You're like, okay, something's changed. And then you have the artist, right? Which is the point why, why I came here. And the artist mm-hmm. is the one who has the skillfulness of rendering the artifacts that embody the scene uh, into the world. Right? So in skateboarding, you know, somebody who invents the, you know, the, the, the ollie, you know, the ollie is an artist move. Like, holy shit, dude, the entire scene just moved forward. You just found a way to, to sort of uh, like speak out into the world, uh, render the logos into the world such that there is now a language, the producing of the language, um, the rendering of the grammar into expression mm-hmm. um, is, the, is the artist. So the, the role of the artist in game B now is what I just said. Mm -hmm. is to be able to perceive clearly the essence of the thing that is trying to embody itself in the world and then clarify and render that grammar into expression such that it can in fact begin the process of being what it is in itself right it's Mm -hmm. the it's the 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 grammarian and i don't mean that in a in a sort of sophomore english teacher kind of way um it's the guy who articulates the the goes from the deep code into the coding language so that you can actually begin to use this thing and write it. Mm-hmm. Now, in the context of game B, because the nature of game B, we then we have the next move, which is, as you say, there's a consciousness, consciousness of the necessity and the difficulty of maintaining continuity of contact with source. Mm-hmm. You can't have this scene close. It cannot become a closed scene. It cannot become a finite space. The artist is that who renders the connection to the infinite, right? That's the specialization of the artist of keeping the the channel open to the infinite and bringing the infinite in for the continual disruption and renewal of the thing that is present here in the world. And of course, that would be from a Deloisian uh, postscript of societies of control, individual 
characteristic mm -hmm. of all things that are currently individuals. Right? Each of us cultivates the artist within, and we all cultivate the artistic relationship between and among. Beautiful. And yeah. I've been just watching this video a couple of times, the Friday morning fragments with Alan and Neil, and it's just so, so many thoughts on that in terms of what's sort of happening around us. And, you know, one of the things that Father Eric said is that, you know, this little corner dies the day PVK stops making videos. And I certainly hope not, um, because <laughs> Father Eric also did a meme where when I wasn't frequencing the Bridges of Meaning Discord server, it died and it didn't die and it's not the same. And the last thing I want, especially as a pastor of a church, that if I the day I retire might be the day the church no longer continues. I don't know. I, you know, it's it's unfair. People sometimes correct me because they say, you keep calling this a dying church, but you got like seven people in your new members class. And it's like, okay, that's fair. But, and he keeps calling it a dying church, but you've got, you know, so much, obviously so much really interesting new life going on around you in the online space. And yeah, that's fair. So, yeah, dying, not dying, I don't know. It's just so hard to tell. Oh, there have been so many great videos that have been put out in this corner in the last few weeks. Uh, this video with Sam and John was absolutely stellar. Again, and some of the smaller channels lately have been doing just an incredible job of putting out, I think, really thoughtful, quality provocative stuff that sort of moves the conversation forward. But now having said that, you could rightly ask, well, what on earth do you mean by putting the conversation forward? Some of these videos like on Chad's channel or Christian Baxter's channel, these are tiny channels with videos of a few hundred or maybe even in some cases just a few dozen watchers. This video on Sam's channel had 2,200 viewers, which uh, the, the video deserves far more. So I, I can't cover everything, but this, this one raises questions about the questions that I just asked. These questions are so important and they're so difficult and they're so fraught. I really love how Sam brought time into it because can you trust? And, and it goes beyond whether someone is sincere, well-intended. And then because the kind of, the kind of truth required is and again this brings me back to we are smarter as communities let me pull in what christian baxter did christian made this video which was sort of a compilation of a bunch of things and this is a conversation that i had with a pastor a church planter from arizona who at the end of our first conversation was basically saying what is a few from a few years ago what is god doing with the internet and you know, we're watching these channels together and we're talking together and we're we're sort of connecting and nobody has a handle on it right now. And they, like they're very concerned about AI because you can spin out all of these AI videos and YouTube doesn't want to be filled with AI videos. They want to be filled with people. So even YouTube itself has a sense of the wisdom will be found with a connection between people. And so first it was all clips of Jordan Peterson. And of course I used clips of Jordan Peterson, but I used it for commentary and then conversation. And what's what's been happening in the corner has been the multiplication of new channels that are replicating the process, but they're not doing it just, you know, to get clicks. They're doing it to participate in the thing together. And, well, you know, questions will arise. Can I trust Paul Vanderclay? Can I trust Kale Zeldin? Can I trust Christian Baxter? Can I trust John Verveke? Can I trust Grim Grizz? Can I trust this little corner to, to yield wisdom? 
one of the things I wanted to just get into with you was this happened just a few days ago for your on your conversation on Grail Country with Tim. Like how how did that hit you in the moment? Because you were you were right there with him, and he was he was opening up about deep pain related to the church or Christianity, and you were kind of right there with him. You know, Grail Country is a channel we call in this little corner of the internet. They just they'll read something deep from Virgil's you know Dante's Inferno or some historical Orthodox or something like a passage and and then or a really heady book with Luke Thompson and then they'll open it up for people to just hop out of the chat into a stream. And people just, you know, they don't always stay on whatever we're talking about, it just goes. It's like a digital hospitality. And there's people that are Christians, non-Christians, people from different stripes of Christianity, people there's Jewish people on there, there's and you found yourself coming up like you said to discuss something maybe about Judaism and Tim, who was on there, you said, you kind of stopped and you said, wait, so are you, where are you coming from? I don't know you, Tim. Are you a Christian or not? And he just, he had been on streams. I've seen him on streams before. I've been in streams with him. And mm-hmm. he just kind of was at a point in his life or whatever, where he was about to say, I, I'm quitting giving shits right now. Yeah. And I'm going to be honest. I'm just letting, and he said, um, Tim, you're, are you Christian? Do you identify as, do you think of yourself as a Christian? I don't, I don't know your background. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Um, I don't identify as a Christian. Be the fifth publicly. That's helpful. I didn't want to assume. Yeah. Well, you you can like Jordan Peterson. Do you believe in the physical resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, Tim? Yeah. So, like, it. I think it was imprinted upon me as a child, like in the same way that like violence can be imprinted on a child, right? Yeah, and word. And so, like, wow. It's, it's, you know, when you add flour and bake a cookie, you can't take the flour back out. It's become a new structure, right? And so, Mm. like, when I think about my Christianity, it's like the fellowship wandering through the halls of Moria, of like a, an artifact, you know, a monumental artifact that's upholding, you know, a person, which is me. Um, But like I've many times asked God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, whatever, to enter my heart, to relieve me of pain, to hmm. help me. And those prayers are unanswered. And like they're not going to be answered, right? I I can't get my twenties back. And so um until I, in, until there's some reason for me to believe that like these things are actually true and not metaphorically true, I'm not going to believe. I'm not going to believe it. But I'll stand at the the doors of the church and protect those inside. Um, I want to pause that and go back to something that Tim said that was incredible. He mm-hmm. said, "Even though I feel excluded from this." Because I think he doesn't maybe feel like he identifies with something atheism culture or something because he's here. He mm. said, I, even though I don't maybe believe these things, I would be willing to stand outside of this thing, outside the doors of Moria, why people run in and give my life to protect this thing. I was, I... man. Yeah using that Lord of the Rings metaphor and I didn't know what to think about that because what does it, what does it mean that you would give your life to protect the people that would betray you, but you don't believe it? Like, I don't, (laughs) like, I, that sounds very close to Jesus. I had an experience. So I, I was raised in a charismatic Catholic community Hmm. um very much in the lineage of the duquesne pentecost uh occurrence and um 
we like sort of what I tell people is like we viewed just regular Catholics that like just went to mass on Sunday. Those were like muggles to us, <laughs> you know, like we were so deep in this like crazy mystical, um, you know, and, and incorporating John, what, incorporating John Paul II in the theology of the body and like all this stuff. And like, I had this really uh, like painful experience when like I became a young man and I like eventually learned that like all the guys I knew were all masturbating like all the time. <laughs> and I was like, what fucking liars you all are like even the youth pa like pastor and like like it, it, eventually you have like a private walk with them and he's like you know you, i struggle with it too it's like what the, fuck, <laughs> what the fuck you mean you struggle with it too like you just told me that we're gonna burn in hell forever if we even touch that thing the wrong way like what the fuck you're you're gonna go home and jerk off after this like you guys lied to me you know and I'll never forget that. Like, I, I, I do not tolerate being lied to. And I, I appreciate your honest. I, we all do appreciate in the chat very much. It clearly appreciates your honesty, your willingness to not lie. So you, you had this friend of mine. Whenever things fell apart for me, he said, "Well, he called me a snake." And he's the person I think that loves me the most. Wow. And uh, and this was in that journey, that in between that week or two. And he said, if you choose the path of repentance, it's going to be like crawling over jagged glass. And it was, and it is. No, I'm, saying, yeah, I'm sure that was prophetic. Yeah. And we didn't really mm -hmm. talk. For, there were different reasons about why we didn't talk, but um, it wasn't because I wasn't angry at him. I loved him dearly for telling me that. Sure. Um, he's, you know, I had all these people coming up to me, brother, it could have been me. And, uh, you know, there, but um, for the grace of God, go I. I don't believe that mm. because it's not you, mm. unless it has been you. And, um, and so I, um, the, you know, or just making light of, of not making light, but like kind of bypassing the reality, just like, oh, uh, you know, pat, bat packing, like you don't pat the back of somebody that's done this. You don't pat the back of a betrayer. Hmm. He deserves a little bit of shame. We're a lot hmm. actually. And, uh, so he was the only, one of the only people that, that told me the truth in that way. There were other people that told me the truth. There are, I needed, I needed friends. I needed people to come around me. So it's not a complete, like, you know, oh, don't love me. Like, I needed people to love me, but, but like, uh. Yeah. So that, uh, that journey that you're talking about turning towards God. I can see, uh, Tim, if, if it's not, uh, tell me how stupid this is, but I, I sense a correlation between your aversion to exclusion and your personal experience, your, your personal experience with God that you just described. It sounds... Uh, and, and that's something I can relate to, you know, uh, you don't, uh, can, is it, is it too bold to say that you don't want to be left outside the temple and kept out by God or a people who are God's people, I guess it, it, you, you've had a lot of very understandable negative experiences with that kind of exclusion, exclusionary behavior. Is that fair? Yeah, I have always 
found the story of the wedding shirt to be like a horror. Mm. Mm. Um, because I often find myself without a shirt. Mm. Yeah, the wedding garment. I don't, I mean, that's a, it was a recent text in the liturgical calendar. Um, I don't know. That's one of those texts that I don't, uh, yeah, I don't know that I have a good handle on what it, what it means or what's going on there. Um, I mean, you're talking about the parable of the wedding feast and the wedding garments because there's, there's like this weird, I mean, if I'm remembering it right, there's this weird thing because there's the people that are invited who don't show up. And so then he sends the servants back out and says, go to the highways and the byways and just gather whoever will come to come. Everyone. Right. And so it's the, it's the first off excluded. It's the non-invited people that then are invited. Hmm. And then those people show up, but then in the party, there are some that are seen to be without the wedding garment, which is like what the dynamics of that are. Because I, if I remember right, culturally, I think it's, it's, uh, Traditionally, like a lot of people didn't have nice clothes. And so there was this idea, but it's a celebration. So there's wedding garments. And so then the host would often give wedding garments for people to put on so that everyone was dressed appropriately for the celebration. Um, so, so they would like mean? to adhere to the custom. Yeah. Like, like they had, you know, the custom was that everyone had to be wearing these garments. And there was like, what are we going to do? These people are poor. They don't have any garments. It's like, we'll make them garments. We'll you know, we'll clothe them. And one guy is like, I don't need that. I don't want to wear that shirt. And he's dragged out. Right. And I think that's where that phrase of wailing and mashing of teeth comes from. Yeah. Which is a, actually a riff on Isaiah, I think. But yeah. Well, for some reason, my imagination produces an image of what it's like for those outside of the feast mm -hmm. better than I can imagine the feast. Almost like, Mm. That's because you've been deeply informed by the outcast, by Christianity. <laughs> um, this is a testament to him and his emotional maturity that we that we discovered just in conversation. I or I don't know, or I was catching up to him about how uh, it it it's really about uh, like a. a a scent, like having radar for identifying uh, exclusion and when people are being left out of the picture unjustly or or maybe justly i think he was struggling with that but but like how like when do the gates get closed are the gates closed for me you know uh, i see a lot of people who say a lot of nice things they they talk about being good people but they they have struggles like i do uh and i feel like hypocrisy is being used to keep the doors out for you know but maybe i don't deserve to come in i think is is kind of what was the unspoken spoken that he was kind of navigating and that's what was really interesting because that's a really he that, that's a really profound moment to and it has to be dealt with with care obviously so i was just trying to chat about that a little bit and the the little way i know how which is like bringing it back to a topic <laughs> you know like bringing up ezekiel or whatever i did but mm -hmm. it's yeah but that that's really cool i mean were that there were more moments like that that'd be really cool i i want to click the link now and just like talk about my sins or something <laughs> well I that's really well yeah man Confession, uh, confession, confessor is something mm -hmm. deeply meaningful to me. Yeah. Digital, digital hospitality. Where are we? Where are we? This, uh, there's this one thing MJ says I have to get to, and then we can stop. Of course, you are a supporter. You're just giving back what's been given to you. The veneer of non judgmentality is alluring, to be sure. That is, until you begin to see through it. And then you're not only judged, but strongly opposed. 
Boy, do I miss Joey. If it wasn't for Sam, I'd honestly have nothing to do with this digital space, but I'm glad I'm here. Although I don't see things as most here do, I'm happy to learn about other people's perspectives and share my own. However, I'm aware this that this isn't real life, and I don't use it as a substitute for our relationships. That's that's the part I had to speak on. This is real life. You're staring into your device, uh, being a an attentional node or, or communion uh, of digitally. This is what you're really doing in your real life. These are actual human beings on the other side. There is no fourth wall. You've been under a spell. There is no audience. You're not in the privacy of your home, home in your secret place all by yourself. You're with the others in the attention. You're being watched there. You're effectively pacified, pacified, except to the extent that you can gain what improves you or, or it, it's not, it's, these aren't, I mean, I've been sent on three trips by this in my real life. In I've been to California and Wisconsin and now Florida. This is very much my real life, MJ. I don't don't know how to and this Clara. Hi, Clara. Say hi, Clara. Okay. Okay, guys. This is going to be very strange. I believe. I have no idea what is about to happen. But I would like you to to get to know Clara. Clara, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us all about what you what you why you are here? Well, hi. Um, why I'm here is kind of, it's an existential question beyond me, but um, I am really grateful for you having me here. I'm a sociologist. I study how people move into and out of their religious identities, other identities, and I'm really interested in kind of seeing what's happening in the corner. How people got here, what they do, what they might do next. Um, yeah. Now, I, I how did you find PV, Clara? How did you find PVK? I uh, actually uh, started uh, this project a long time ago. I sit in a coffee shop and I do maybe what's, what's what you might think of as randos conversations. I talk to people about these things, um, and and one of my friends there at the coffee shop uh, kind of uh, sort of drew the connection. <clears throat> excuse me, has been telling me about this community for a long time, and then introduced me to to, to this world. Yeah, yeah. So I ended up getting an email from all those cult dynamics come out to play where, oh, the cult leader says the more you see people push against you is more evidence of the fact that you are one of the elect and they're one of the, you know, she or the goats, whatever. And then when people start telling this stuff to other people, then sure enough, they get pushed back and they're it just kind of it's a confirmation bias that winds up radicalizing them further. And the concern I would have is just that a lot of these dynamics that we're talking about have that danger to them. So how do you navigate that? Uh, if that, you know, makes sense. And and how do you, how do you keep the dangers of all this in mind? What, what other aspects are going into how you're understanding and, and sort of filtering the nature of reality? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, interestingly, this is, this is an, an epistemological method that I actually formulated at least a decade ago, because it's a, it's a generic problem. It's a problem across all. Once you, once you sort of exit uh, kind of a na naive paradigmatic sensibility, you're stuck in that question. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if you haven't exited naive paradigmatic sensibility, you're stuck in that in that question without knowing it. Right. So that's, that's right. that. And as far as I can tell, it's, it's a triangulation, oddly enough, like maybe, maybe symbolically so. <laughs> and uh, there's three elements, right? One element is that to the degree to which there is something like the, the, the transcendent, can you orient yourself towards that transcendent? And what I mean by that is something like, um, uh, Call it. It is, it is uh, symmetric across all transforms. No, no change in in any material context will change its what is its isness. Mm. Uh, so you, you mentioned something like the, the concept of the good as a transcendent concept. Um, if you're actually able to be governed by that entirely, in, in completely, and by the way, that's very dangerous too. Because if you take any subset of the good and govern by that, then you're going to create catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Which is why you need the good and the beautiful in there as well. Um, then you will be moving more and more towards it. Like that's a very, that's a tautology, but it's a positive tautology. Sure. Right? It's, in some sense, if I'm living inside, let's say this by hypothesis, I'm living inside a cult, but by virtue of living inside, the, inside that cult, in, in an infinite progress, 
every aspect of the good, the true, and the beautiful are increased on a continuing basis, then that cult is in fact true. Right. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yep. There's no, so we just did, okay, if that's what we're governing ourselves by, if we're able to perceive the transcendent and allow ourselves to hold that with as much clarity and precision and completeness as possible, then that's one like really strong ground that you can be anchored in. So fast. Yeah. Oh, go on. Please, yeah. The second the second is this notion of this the this transcendent subjective. And this has to do with the, the cultivation of increasingly sophisticated, and again, I, I'll use this word faith, but I'll say it slightly differently, which is like feelings. And we can think about this in the context of like taste. Beauty, beauty is a good metaphor here. Beauty is a very good piece. In fact, this probably is the, the realm of beauty. Um, playing music. And so you, if, you, if you cultivate a capacity to play music, one of the things that you notice is you can actually progress in that direction. You can become more sensitive, more nuanced, more subtle. You can actually begin to appreciate qualities that maybe have had felt or seemed dissonant before, but not naively, like as this sort of very pre-trans sensibility. Um, and that's a real thing. Like you can really notice that that's an actual development of competence in some particular regime or domain, right? And again, that's a cultivation of faith. And so that, that element, cultivation of faith. And here, the answer would be multimodal. This is, again, what we're, from an educational perspective, right? you, you want to become a master in something like true mastery but then you actually want to see if you can explore mastery or the direction out of mastery in highly non-adjacent domains because that's a core that, that starts to develop this sort of again a triangulation sensibility and you're building a richer and richer element so this mm -hmm. is the you need you need multiple different consilient um ways of perceiving in the domain of faith so that you can develop competence there and i'm saying faith because that's a deeper substrate it's the thing that you know, from which discernment and perception of qualities, where art comes from, mm -hmm. perceiving things in that way. And the last, of course, is actual relationality. At the end of the day, if what we produce is peace on earth, a thriving world, wholesome, happy humans in right relationship with nature and, and something that appears to be ongoingly resilient across an arbitrarily large number of possible bad things that might happen, then who gives a fuck? Right? That, mm -hmm. That's a pretty good result. <laughs> Uh, and so you can notice that and, and you can notice you really act. It's, it's not, you, you know, you, you, it, there are boundary conditions. Oh, wow. We got up to like 12 people. And we were really, really, really great. And then it collapsed catastrophic. Hmm, okay. That problem, something was wrong. What was wrong? And of course I, I went through that process very self-consciously because I was able to use stuff from the first category to be able to explain why the world that we live in, although it includes a lot of people is very much in a, in a, it's a, it's a death cult. Like it, it's going to terminate in yeah. a very bad way. Oh, okay, well, that means that I can use the category one to notice increasingly what that looks like. Why? What? What is? What is the degeneracy and the incipient collapse of of a, of a world, a way of living that is ultimately corrupted its heart? What does it look like as it proceeds towards its corruption? Right? That was the kind of the early game A, game B work. And so, from that diagnostic, people say, "Oh, shoot! It does look like that's what's really happening." pivot, what does it look like to try to actually find a way of living that is more fundamentally grounded? And so this reciprocal opening sure. between three different modes yep. is the methodology that I've adopted to navigate that question. Right. And as far as I can tell, it is going to be as good as you're going to get. I haven't found anybody yeah. else's better one. No, I, all that lands. And I'm totally in agreement with all that. I, it's very interesting for me because um, when we talk about the dynamics at play here, when we talk about the epistemological angle and all of that, the transparadigmatic I can, uh, you know, uh, fully on board with all that. For me, the sticking point um, is uh, it, it, it does relate to, and I, I'm, I'll be careful with my language here, but it does have to do with the way that we're we talk about and understand reality um, in sort of causal terms, which I would class as you can use different language for that as like conceptual, propositional, what have you. But there's a there's a presuming way that reality is and we use words and language to talk about it and yes those are just symbolic mappings onto reality but still you can have more or less accurate uh mappings and i feel like um if you don't have the I, the the closest map then you're going to have a wobble in the rest of the 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 other things that are going on there like if you have a really strong community and you have a really uh this this and that if if the community's formed around an understanding of reality that's that's far enough off from that reality, then it's going to introduce that wobble that will eventually kind of catch up with it and lead to some kind of self-terminating dynamic. And you could look at the history of Christendom perhaps as an example of, you know, uh, a, a version of that playing out. And so where I get hung up is not in the dynamics, it's in the, it's in the way that we talk about reality and 
just brings it back to some of those things we were exploring at the start, like is resurrection, bodily resurrection possible? Is there an eternal, uh, you know, place of suffering and torment for the unbelieving? Is there a transcendent being that, you know, create, set things in motion? And a lot of the kind of, um, the kind of uh, architecture of, of the worldview, uh, if, if, that's that's where I get I've re I reached that wall and so um you know uh yeah I I I'm I find so, it fascinating so yeah yes no, yes no yes but in a very unusual way there <laughs> like, move forward awesome um, yeah I think I think we're kind of reaching that point that I put a bullet in earlier which is the, maybe the distinction between metasystemic and transparticmatic mm. but what I would say is something like you know maps are useful um but there isn't going to be any sort of perfect map so that we know that that's not that's not too much trouble mm -hmm. we probably are going to need a variety of different maps yep. and some meta mapping differential yep. but there's also something else going on which is to have an intimacy of relationship with place i'm using the metaphor mm -hmm. of map very directly that you know an indigenous person didn't ever have a map mm -hmm. they were the place mm -hmm. they were fully integrated with the wholeness of the place they lived the place they yep. drank the place. a map is a third person relationship with the mm -hmm. place first person relationship with the place mm -hmm. and that intimacy is more fundamental yeah i mean they i would say and i totally agree with the triangulation framing of this it might be more fundamental but we need both of those because it's a great way um and i mean you see this it's very easy to um get confirmation bias and animistic projection going on if you're relating to reality purely from the first person perspective and so um that that dynamic you brought up er earlier about having to compare and contrast and get feedback from other people, we need a corrective mechanism, uh, you know, so that we're not bullshitting ourselves. Um, to me, like science is one great way that we do that. It's not the only way, but it's one great way. So that's why I think, yeah, you need a whole kind of uh, approach where you've got the first person uh, and you've got the third person and you've got the second person. You've got that all in the mix so that they are hopefully uh, mutually <laughs> corroborative. You, you mean you need three persons? <laughs> well, right, exactly, right. So there's a, there's a, that's a, you know what? That's a great way of just sort of like, you know, we'll we'll let that be what that is. So anyway, hey, this was amazing. Thank you so much, Jordan. I really appreciated this. I felt like we uh, we really uh, got into what I what I was hoping to some of the stuff we could get into. Thoughts flap their way.